Samir, my brother, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for coming back for part two. Uh, part one was me. part one was pretty awesome, and uh, I think we left a lot on the table in terms of nutrition and some lifestyle stuff that we didn't get into. So for anyone listening, um, if you're just tuning into part two, make sure you go listen to part one and get uh, get some of the backstory uh, from Samir as well and some of the other topics that we we dove into. Um, yeah, so I wanted to focus a little bit on nutrition here because we didn't get into that um, at all, really, because yep. nutrition is a, a total beast on its own. And it's something I love discussing and, and talking about because it's a very polarizing topic, right? Um, it can be very confusing for the average person who doesn't put a lot of time into um, you know doing their own research and reading and experimenting with, with their own bodies, right? It can be very very confusing because a lot of this stuff has spectrums, right? You have people shouting really loudly on, on both ends of the spectrum. Yeah. And a lot of times the truth is somewhere in the middle and it's, it's, there's a lot of, it depends going on there too. Right. Um, but it depends, isn't always a, a sexy answer that, that sells, right? Sometimes it's, yeah. you know, people like to use, uh, you know, ultimatums and, and whatnot for things. Right. So, um, I think a good place to get started is maybe, we could talk a little bit, um, a little bit about the obesity crisis. Cause I think this is something, um, that's pretty mind blowing, pretty shocking. I, I can't remember the last stats that I saw, but I think it was something like in the high, high 20% around 30% of Canadians are obese. Now, um, it's higher in the States, but still, you know, pretty high in Canada. Um, so, you know, what do you, what are some of the factors that that you think is there one factor that stands out that kind of contributes to that because i think for me from what i've seen it seems like a lot of sort of the trend starting to rise really quickly is sort of like the 1950s 1960s that's when things really started to change right and sometimes if you look back and you see some of these old photos of like people on the beach and crowds of people in the 40s you look around there's there's not one overweight person in this entire crowd and if you contrast that with a picture of today of people at the beach or a carnival or a concert or something, it's pretty noticeable how many, how many people are sort of overweight compared to, to back then. So is, is there any, you know, one contributing factor or, I mean, I'm sure there's a, there's, there is a lot of contributing factors, no doubt, but is there one that kind of stands out to you, uh, in terms of that, that shift for society? Yeah, I, I think it's actually fairly easy to follow. It's one, it's two ingredients. Uh, one one thing. So in 1974, so just, just referring back to what you said, if you look at pictures prior to the 70s, it would be an outlier if you saw one person that looked a little bit heavy or moved into like a heavy BMI or, or obesity, right? And so any beach, anywhere you went, everyone would have a certain look. Uh, there was no one that was really overweight. And then we introduced, without science, with, with no, like, there was doctors, there was PhDs, there was uh, scientists, there was the, the cream of the cream that was saying, this is not scientific, but that was kind of overruled. And in the States, it started with uh, kind of dietary regulations because of uh, the concern for heart disease. I don't know if it started with Roosevelt. One of them had uh, a heart attack. But in 1974, the guidelines began. And from the inception of 1974 onwards, if you look at a graph, they changed what we ate. So we were heavily meat-based, so animal products, dairy products, eggs, uh, whole food, non-processed foods, not a high content of carbohydrates, and that got switched. So we went to low fat, right? Low protein, high carbohydrate, and we introduced seed oils. So industrial processed seed oils. So two ingredients, the consumption per year went up, seed oils and sugar. So take your pick. And if you graph it from 1974, it goes like this. So when you are talking to, say, scientists, uh, any kind of like high level researching person, you can choose either one. You can say seed oil or you can say sugar, but they both do the same thing. They both create oxidative stress. They both uh, create glycation. 
they both create basically stickiness and rustiness at the cellular level, which raises insulin, which then tells your body to continually store. And now you can see like year by year by year. So every decade, the obesity rate has gone up. So in Canada, one out of three people, I believe, are obese. But I think we're moving to 50%, if not more. I just came from, uh, I think it was last month, I was at uh, an obesity conference with one of the top obesity uh, researchers there, doctor and uh, researcher. And uh, we're moving at 50% of the population is overweight. So it is an epidemic um, and it's following that graph. So I would say uh, it's the consumption of sugar and it's the consumption of seed oils. And when you graph it, there is a relationship. And when you take people off of seed oils and sugar consumption, guess what happens? Their BMI comes down. Their, you know, their, their obesity rate, uh, they're not up here. It starts to come down. So you tell me. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. And I think, um, you know, some people will say also, um, just the, the addition of those, those things into the diet also just increases calories. So people are consuming more calories and, and moving a little bit less. Um, so I think that that's got to play in somewhat. I think people were just more active, um, before then too, we didn't have as many screens and entertainment and people were out running around and, and, and whatnot and doing a little bit more. But like you said, I mean, the, those, those two big changes, I mean, there's no way you can deny those. And just, cause you just, as soon as you add those in, you see the graph just move, right? Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty easy to follow, but you brought up calories and I'm glad you brought up calories. So that's actually a, an excellent point in the sense of, People, uh, the food chain. So when you have a processed food, and when we say processed food, it's all these chemicals. So you, you hear me say process, it's going to be like seed oils. It's going to be superheated, uh, like heat will be in their chemicals. And what happens is it becomes calorically dense, but not nutritionally dense. And that's mm -hmm. what's changed. So you can have a bowl of cereal and it's going to be like massive calories possibly, but there's no nutritional density. And when you look at the nutritional uh, label and it says there's, you know, iron and vitamin C and, vit and all these vitamins, what people don't understand is, sure, those vitamins were put in at the start of the process. And this isn't illegal. You can, you, so you can put on a nutritional label like what you started with, but that's not what you end with. And that's what people don't understand. So uh, it's not bioavailable anymore. Like when you superheat things, it denatures it. It's done. So... If you're wondering why you're still anemic or, you know, why you can't put on tissue because you're eating your Kellogg cereal every morning, it's because it doesn't have those things. It's like very, very limited. So you're getting the bare minimum, just like uh, when someone something says it has iron. Well, that iron has changed, denatured. It's not the same as when it started. And it wasn't even in the form that you could accept. So that's what happens. So very calorically dense, like big calories but nothing to it, so not nutritionally dense. And I think that's something that I've talked about when people are like counting calories and, and just wrapping their head around calories and what should be my caloric intake. And I'm like, why aren't you talking about what should be my nutrition intake? What should be the nutritional density that I'm looking for? What what are the key components that I need today? You know, like say, uh, say potassium. You know, people don't even wrap their head around how much potassium they need. They could have, they could need on a daily value 4,700 milligrams of potassium, all right? Do you think anyone is going through their diet and counting the milligrams of potassium? They're not. They, they call me up and they're like, how many grams of protein should I be eating? You know, it's always like same basic questions because everyone thinks they're bodybuilders, right? They all think that they're, they're weightlifters. Mm -hmm. That's not... That's not how you, you figure in your caloric intake, so to speak, for just an average person. Yeah, and that's, that's no way to, to live either, right? Like it's one of those things with like counting calories and macros and micronutrients. Like the way I see it is like, you know, it, it can work for, for some people for a period of time and whatnot. And there's people that are, you know, they're so overweight or so obese, you know, literally making very small changes is going to have an impact, right? But at some point, 
you know, it's really about how optimal do you want to be, right? Do you just want to like not be morbidly obese and just be slightly overweight or do you want to be, you know, healthy and, and lean and whatnot? Right. Yeah. Um, and I think too, in terms of the, you know, like counting calories and, and macros and, and everything, it's, it's very challenging and to do it really properly and to keep track of all those things and to fit that into your, your daily life. Like you're not, you're not a machine. It's not that easy to keep track of, of all those things properly. Um, we're not just a computer program. Where we could plug in all these specific numbers and magically know what's everything. And even like you said, with the food labels, right. You know, just because it's on the label, doesn't that mean that that's exactly to the, to the number that you're actually getting and whatnot. Right. So I know personally I've, cause I've, I've tried that approach in the past. I've done that for a while, tracking everything, you know, and I found personally, like just switching to not worrying about that stuff at all and just focusing on, um, you know, quality and whole foods, the body has, uh, an am amazing way of just figuring all that stuff out for you. Right. And just, yeah. it, it will figure it out. Like there's no, like if you were eating whole foods, you were not going to overeat. That's it's very hard. Like if you have a, um, you know, a steak and some fermented vegetables and uh, some blueberries, like you're not going to feel unsatisfied after, right. Versus if you eat yeah. some high carbohydrate processed meal, you know, an hour later, you're reaching for the bag of chips because you're, because you're hungry again and your blood sugar is all over the place. And it's like, oh, now I have to, I'm allowed 400 grams of these chips and, uh, there's 500 grams left in the bag. So I might as well just finish the bag. And it just like, it yeah. doesn't, it doesn't work long term, right? For some people, like, especially like you said, if you're a really strict bodybuilder and that's your entire lifestyle and you're tracking everything to a T and making, you know, these little micro adjustments to change from 4% to 3% body fat, like, okay, okay. Right. But that's, that's not the average person that doesn't apply to the the general population. Um, I don't think yeah. that those things can work for most people. Well, I mean, when you talk about calories, you got to wrap your head around the sense of this is like physics and energy expenditure. Okay. Uh, that has nothing to do with food. So there's a whole history of how, you know, one person got this started and decided to use this as a metric in food, but really let's just pause for a second. So we have this isolated chamber, all right? So it's, it's, a uh, it's not even representative of how the human body works. We take this isolated chamber and we burn stuff to figure out how much energy it, that it takes to change uh, a water by one degree. And then you figure out calories. Like nothing, do you think that's how your body works? Where you burn <laughs> something, heats up water, and therefore you figure out how much energy you expend. So. When people are like, there are some people online and they are vehement, they're fired up. And I will say they're usually young. That, I mean, that's just anecdotal. I, I see their personal trainers. They're like from 20 to 30 in that range. And they call people like me quacks. If I don't believe that it's calories in, calories out and thermodynamics, I'd love for them to walk me through a th thermodynamics <laughs> Um, you know, kind of uh, symposium or, or their understanding of energy. But so you're taking this uh, unrealistic kind of way we measure heat and applying it to the body and then thinking that it's like exactly the same. It's, it's not even close. If you have, you know, me taking 100 grams of, say, uh, ground beef to 100 grams of sweet potato, to 100 grams of, of a Milky Way bar. Yeah, they're all 100 grams or 100 calories. But, oh my goodness, like just for you to figure out how, how many calories they are and burning it and matching it still is not representative of what happens from the time it goes in the mouth. It is so complex. I mean, from the time it goes into the mouth, each type of food that you eat sends a signal. Each food has a signal, therefore it controls satiety. It controls ghrelin, leptin, so your hunger hormone, your satiation hormone. So there's already chemical stuff going in. So how can you talk about calories in, calories out? Just by the very fact that I put food in my mouth is gonna determine like say amylase, that the enzyme that we're releasing to start breaking down starches and carbohydrates. You know, it goes, it goes down the funnel, you know, goes into your belly. Um, the dynamics, the chemistry of, of 
of breaking the food down, going into the small intestine, what gets absorbed, what doesn't get absorbed. Is it setting off insulin? Is it not setting off insulin? Is it releasing glucose? Those aren't small little details. Those, those are pretty huge details because that will determine if you're going to have a craving, if you're going to be hungry, if you're going to burn fat, if you're going to store fat, if you're going to use glucose, are you going to convert it to glycogen? You see how complex it can get? So I almost say it's a level of insanity. It's a level of crazy when someone starts to talk about calories like, it's a no-brainer, guys. You have 1,500 calories a day. You go on the treadmill. You burn 250, and they give you your recipe. And just like you said, sure, if you're morbidly obese, just thinking about walking, you will lose weight. If you just change your routine by a little bit, you start to lose weight. But on the long run, do you know how many people sit in my chair that have done every you know calorie type of diet? They, they pick a diet, but because they don't take in consideration the complexity of what food does, they just think everything is the same. And this is the allotment. And I've done a video where I talk about calories versus content. Why are you counting calories? You should be counting content, micronutrients. Did I get, you know, did I get my iron today? Did I get my vitamin C? Did I get my vitamin A? Did I get my vitamin K? Did, did I get the requirements that my body needs? Not, I'm allowed to eat that muffin because I have 500 calories left. Like, that. no one thinks that's crazy. Like, you, you get an allowable amount of brownies, you get an allowable amount of vanilla cake and ice cream. Like no one in the room thinks that's crazy. And the ones that don't think it's crazy, look at who's eating that way. They love the fact, like they absolutely love the fact that they can eat what they want. They can reward themselves with their cake and their cookies because, you know, the Weight Watcher diet said so. But to me, like, I can't even wrap my head around that. And I can't wrap my head around people that somehow can justify it. But when you go by calories, you can justify everything. You're like, oh, it's in my calories. So just like mm -hmm. <laughs> they're eating chips. Oh, it's in my calories. But I don't care if it's in your calories. Is it in your content list, right? Mm -hmm. but it definitely gets me fired up. And I'm very shy online. This is probably like the most that I've been outspoken where I've always wanted to say something online, but I just don't want to get into a, like a, a fired up conversation with someone that doesn't understand. Like mm -hmm. I'm willing to listen. If you know how calories are burnt, you know, the system, the, the, the chemical breakdown, we can have a dialogue. Sure. I'll talk about calories. But if, if you, don't know all that stuff, how can we even start to have a conversation? Oh, yeah, but that's not, yeah, the, the comment section is not the, the right place for that kind of a, a conversation, right? It's not going to, you're not going to get anything out of it. It's just going to be a shouting match and talking over each other. But it's, it's not like a meaningful conversation like this, right? Like some of the best conversations are when people go on a podcast and have, a, you know, there's a moderator and it's a respectful conversation and you can kind of go back and forth and figure things out and find common ground, right? Um, you just, yeah, there's, it's not going to happen. And, it's, and, and you know what? A lot of people are not, not really willing to learn new things because they've dug so deeply into, you know, their position. Right. So it becomes more of a, it feels like more of an attack on their ego because they're so attached to certain ideas. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the thing I think with calories, calories, people that are super, you know, focused on that and they'll look at someone like you who's saying there's more to it. And they're saying, Oh, they just don't understand the science. It's like, no, we understand the science. That's not the issue here. It's more of the application of the science into our specific bodies. Right? Like it just, it's just not an apples to apples type thing. Right. Well, well, uh, that's what fires me up. So using the word science and all that. So let's throw out the word science for a second and let's use the word chemistry or biology or biochem. Or how about the studies that we've always done? I love studies that we do on uh, twins, okay? Because you've got people with the same genetic material, like especially if they're identical. Oh, we need more of those. Okay. Because those are the best, right? There's yeah. enough studies that people can look at. And I know studies aren't the, you know, the complete be all. 
but it lets it lets you start somewhere. Okay, we've already done this. We've already in the fifties where we get people. We're trying to understand this whole calorie thing: of calories in, calories out. So you give identical twins the same calories. All right. So you get a thousand, you get a thousand. They do all kinds of complicated tests. Right off the hop, both one person gets starts to gain weight. The other person doesn't gain a pound. They've done stuff where the other person loses weight and the other person gains weight. They're identical twins. They're they're under observation. They're eating the same food at the same time. They're given the same exercise. And then even, you know, this uh, calories in, calories out, they do the same exercise and their burn rate is different. Their metabolism is different. So where is the discussion on science? Like, mm-hmm. how would you argue that with me? It's been replicated. So when you're trying to look at a study and understand what a study determines for you, the idea of a study is can we replicate this no matter where you are, no matter who's doing this, the the lab test, right? When you can continually uh, repeat it with success, the hypothesis is proven until disproven. It's mm-hmm. been done over and over and over. There's no more argument. So I don't know what those people are arguing about. And that's what gets me fired up. It's, it's already proven. You, you yourself will know that person that eats like garbage, eats whatever they want, does every wrong thing possible, and they're like a stick, okay? Mm-hmm. Then you have a person that's eating six salads a day, is on the incline like this, doing two-hour treadmill work, you know, jogging, running, and they're, and nothing they do works. Mm-hmm. So where's the argument again? We we anecdotally know people that aren't lying to us. They're not hiding in their closet, eating chocolate cake and ice cream. They're legit. They're working out. They're doing everything that they're supposed to be doing, counting their calories, uh, and trying to burn more, all that stuff. And they are huge. They're they're obese. They're nothing is working for them. Yeah. So, and that's, I, and even, even people that are, you know, even people that are necessarily not the most diligent, just your average person, if you take two people that are, are very, very different and, um, you know, very unique, um, biologically, right. Have different issues going on, whether it's, you know, hormonal or, or whatnot, um, that are just living the average person lifestyle, right. Neither one of them is, you know, necessarily super disciplined in any one way but they can look completely different, right? Yep. So it's not necessarily how complicated, you know, our bodies are in general as a as a human race, but it's also there's so much bio-individuality just between from one person to the next, right? That like trying 100%. to put people in that very small, very, you know, little box of, of calories and, and macros doesn't work. And it's going to work for some people, of course, like everything is going to work for someone, right? That's, that's how it is. All percentage. A very yeah. small percentage. Um, and that's what people use. They use outliers to prove their argument. Well, I, you know, did my 2500 calorie diet. I did this. I expended this much energy and it worked for me. Great. Great. Awesome. Good for you. Which, which I say there's, there's outliers to everything, mm-hmm. but nine out of 10, they're sitting in my chair. They've already done it. They've already done the calories in, calories out, move more, eat less, and made themselves miserable and, you know, lost 40 pounds <clears throat> over three months or six months or one year. And then it all comes back because it doesn't yeah, exactly. work. It just absolutely yeah. doesn't work. Well, yeah, especially, yeah, especially if we're talking about short term versus long term, right? That's, yes. that's the big thing too. Like there's a lot of things that can work in the short term first, right? Like I know. <laughs> Like I know, uh, my dad, a couple, a couple times he's, um, decided to do a, a crash diet and, and done one of those. Um, I forget what the, the name of the, the company is, but one of those companies that just like sends you all your meals in like a very yeah. specific caloric, you know, intake and kind of monitors that. And yeah, yeah, sure. He'll lose weight in you know a few months. Right. But then it's all back because he has no idea how to, how to eat. Like he's starving all the time because he's been starving himself with these stupid microwave little meals. Yeah. His hormones aren't, aren't optimized, right? Like it's not, it's not a long-term solution. Um, you know, like I said before, I said this in a post, um, you know, like people think that 
um, eating, eating, like, let's say fruit, for example, is, is whatever. It's not, uh, not super delicious, but it's like, it's because you're blasting your senses with sugar all the time. It's like it, when you take that stuff out, you don't crave it anymore. There's a certain, you go through a certain time period where you might be going through cravings and you're changing your habits and, and whatnot. But eventually once you get over a hump, it, those things don't really matter to you anymore. And just having yep. some berries tastes like the most amazing thing in the world. That's right. Well, there's, there's actually a, a physiological change. Like we our, our taste buds safeguard us. And um, so we are attracted to salt because you need sodium. And if you don't have sodium, you will die. Just look it up. Mm -hmm. Just, so yep. you know, our whole system is based on telling people to avoid sodium. Crazy. Again, like that's how the whole um, cellular pump works, like sodium pump and calcium pump. Um, so we, we gravitate towards salt. That's why animals will travel miles to get to a salt lick, right? Yep. Uh, animals will lick salt. And one time was the most, one of the most, uh, um, you know, sought after minerals, like people were paid in salt, like soldiers Got in the it. Roman army paid in salt, right? That's how Got valuable it. it is. People don't realize yeah. they didn't have bags they of Lay's chips getting, <laughs> giving them all the salt they need back then. No. So you've got, you've got salt and then sour. Sour uh, gravitates you towards fermented foods. Uh, so the human body is just amazing. Evolution is just amazing what we gravitate. And I never thought about that sour, actually. I, I knew the salt and, and, and sweet and not, but sour, I never thought about that. That's interesting. Yeah. So you will, sour will bring you to fermented foods. And now oversweet is a signal of rot. And so your body will be like, so that's a protective mechanism that gets killed because our sensation of sweet and sugar is all the time. So just like drugs or alcohol, you need more, you need more, you need more. So people don't know that they're, they've killed their taste buds, but they've killed this mechanism, right? So when you start to remove the sensation of sweet, and a, and a lot of my therapeutic approach to food is I teach people to remove the sensation of sweet so that when you do have some raspberries, oh, my goodness you're just like uh, like you're in heaven that's what's supposed to happen okay mm -hmm. that's what's supposed to happen but people are just like they go to a grocery store they eat the fruit and they don't think it's anything so we uh, when something is over sweet that was a mechanism to tell us that this is rotting and we should avoid it uh, so your taste buds start to gravitate so the test that i do with people is i say you know start with a 70 percent chocolate okay uh, dark chocolate or whatever not too much because uh, you might, we might run into the oxalate thing, but we can circle back to that. Uh, I, what I tell them is I want you to take a piece of Baker's chocolate or like 95% chocolate, take a piece of it. And they spit it out. I did it years ago. I ate it and I was like, how can people eat this? It was like sawdust, disgusting. All right. And then I said, three months from now, let's check back. And, and uh, no one's ever said different hmm. so far. That's an interesting and barometer. Yeah, they move from 70%, 75, 80, 85, 95, uh, until uh, they're just like, yeah, it's sweet. They, they'll have a little bit of dark chocolate, maybe with a coffee or something. But yeah, it's pretty wild. These are people that were eating chocolate candy, like Mars bars, stuff like that, and saying, this stuff's disgusting. I don't know how anyone would ever eat this. They're just like, think I'm crazy. And yeah, three months later, 90 days later, they're eating dark chocolate and ch chocolate and loving it. And they're talking to me about a robust uh, flavor. They're talking about, is this, is this supposed to happen? I just feel like my food tastes better. I'm like, hell yeah, that's supposed to happen, right? Um, so our body knows what it's supposed to do. When you start to remove um, sugar and the sensation of sweet because remember you can't measure what insulin is doing so people wear the glucose monitors and they're like into the keto treats into all this diet stuff diet pop and they're like the, my glucose isn't raising i'm good no you're not good your your insulin is skyrocketing and you just can't measure that so every time you have something sweet it tells the body oh this is a carbohydrate and so it starts to prepare for the carbohydrate that's coming in. Therefore, the failure, the complete failure 
of diet products like diet pop and stuff people coming in drinking two liters of diet pop and they're obese and they're not losing weight they've got studies again where they they have a study group that just drinks water they have a study group that drinks this diet pop daily and the group that drinks the diet pop eats more calories is that wild and then they take away the diet pop first the people go into um, withdrawal you actually go through withdrawal when you remove even diet pop and then um, over the course of, I think it's six weeks, you see those people start to eat less calories. So when I first started looking into the sensation of sweet, the mechanism, I was blown away at all the things that it can do. So um, you really have to respect both sugar and sensation of sweet. And then if I may, because you brought it up, uh, when it comes to fruit and uh, fructose, we always, we make all our measurements for glucose and uh, when you break down sugars into their monomers like into their smallest bits um, the one thing that we cannot measure unless you're in some expensive university study or something is a fructose spike and fructose so if you are unhealthy you're 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 not in a good place you are considered metabolic disease where you've been already diagnosed as have a fatty liver you're obese you're diabetic, you have hypertension, you ha you're in that spectrum, fructose is not good. We're, we're, we're not meant to have fructose all the time. And then people will say, well, what about those tropical regions? Absolutely, but they're in a tropical region. So their latitude is going to, where you live, uh, like where your genes are, your, your DNA, that's part of evolution. And they will switch fruits if they're following their season in their tropical areas, or if if plant foods are are coming in seasons, they're not eating the same uh, fruit over and over and over. And general lifestyles, when they're more like true to the original lifestyle, like their ancestral lifestyle, evolutionary wise, they can intake that fructose, especially if they have activity that matches it, right? Because you get a double dose. So if you're a healthy person. Um, I would say fructose is not an issue as long as you're eating it in season and organic uh, because the uh, the synthetic pesticides are just, they're brutal. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you have uh, organic pesticides, it's a little bit easier on the body. And um, I would say you have to be active. You have to treat fructose, which is probably worse than glucose, um, with respect. And if you are sick at all, you should be avoiding fruits until you are moving into a spectrum where you're healthy again. Because remember, fructose gives you a double spike. Uh, it converts glucose, right? Which all cells can take. But then the fructose has to break down and it only can be metabolized in the liver. So if you have a dysfunctional liver, you're screwed, right? Yeah. So people that come in with liver disease, uh, they're diabetic, they've been told to eat six, seven servings. Mind blowing. Six, seven servings of fruit and vegetables. And I'm like, uh, what does your glucose monitor say? And they have upwards of 20. Do you know what that means? Like, it should be at like 5.5. They're like 20. They're, they're, their eyes are, they're going blind, mm -hmm. right? We have to snip their toes off. They're, they're making themselves sick. And as soon as I get them off all those fruits and high glycemic veggies, I just calm them down. Just like... In three months, it makes it makes impact, you know. So it's not that I don't want you to eat fruit. I think people misunderstand me sometimes when I'm talking about fruit, like I'm demonizing fruit. What I'm trying to say is that respect fruit, respect it. So mm -hmm. if we live in Canada and I'm from Ontario and the growing season set, starts like uh, June, July, August, starts to end September, October with, say, apples and pears, starting with the berries and all that, Eat in season, eat organically. You better be active, right? You better be using up that sugar that, that you're uh, intaking. Be reasonable. And I know reasonable and moderate are words that are subjective. So a couple servings, maybe more servings than you normally would in the season. But as you get to those cold months and that fruit is not available, you shouldn't be eating it. That's how the body's designed. The body's designed to take a blast of this fructose that's that's really hard on your system is excellent for fat gain 
That's how you get fat. But fructose loves to turn into fat. So when you have extra fructose, because it took so long in your liver, your liver will get fat or it'll just get stored as fat. So if you want to get fat, eat seven servings of fruit a day and don't exercise, right? Um, and yeah. then Or to- like all these, or a lot of the processed products, it's all high fructose corn syrup, right? Which high is, fructose corn syrup, yeah. which started in uh, the 70s again. So when, when we go back to that graph, so the seed oils, the sugar, the, the converting corn into, uh, into uh, fructose, yeah, it's brutal. Increasing the servings, increasing the serving size itself. I mean, if you look at these fruits, they're like massive. Strawberries are like, um, they look like a racquetball. Like, it's just mm-hmm. mind-blowing. And then you get an organic Ontario strawberry, and it's ugly. It's just like, there's a small little thing. It's a little bit tart, which is fantastic. Um, and then you dress up your your fruits, that's even a safer way to ingest fruits where you put it in uh, a Greek yogurt, you eat it uh, in a salad, which, which has the fiber, you, you eat it, you eat your food and then you, you connect your fruit to right after instead of eating it like a treat or a dessert hours later on its own. So just mm-hmm. getting more savvy with understanding uh, where fruit plays. And I know there's an argument there only in the sense that people that are like, high-functioning athletes, uh, they're super healthy, you know, in their mind. Um, and it usually doesn't catch up with them until they start getting into late 40s, 50s. So they argue. Almost almost all my arguments, actually, it's a, I, I'm bringing up the age thing again because I mentioned age when it comes to calories in, calories out. Everything really works well when you're 20. Mm-hmm. Works great. 20, 25, 30, whatever theory you come up with, Works great. I've been there. I've done all the fads. I've done all the diets. Uh, I did, you know, my my can fit and my personal trainer and, you know, like ni- 99 or, you know, like years ago, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you start hitting in your 50s. Everything changes. Everything catches up with you. And your body gives you the finger. You know what I'm saying? It mm-hmm. says, uh, we're done. Whatever theory you thought was working is not working. Yeah. Right. There's no more there. There isn't that margin of error anymore after a certain there's point. None. Right? There's no buffer in your cells. Literally your cell, it, you know, dysregulates or, or, or there's a dysfunction. So the cell itself, if, if it has a function, it doesn't function the way it's supposed to anymore. Or the regulation of signals, it's sending the wrong signal or it's there's a constant signal. So, you know, take your pick. But cells will literally just go. They just break. They, 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 they either grow too big or they break. And, and stuff that's supposed to be moving in and out doesn't do that anymore. Like even if you have too much fructose and fructose getting converted into fats, say triglycerides, you know, your, your blood serum triglycerides are, are floating about. A triglyceride molecule is really, it's huge. It's big. So there's some mechanisms with insulin you know, the triglyceride can't get in the cell. It's too big. It gets disassembled, right? So if you think of a triglyceride, it has glyceride backbone. There's like tri, so like three uh, fatty acids. It gets broken down. It can go into the cell. And then it gets reassembled in the cell. So now you have this huge piece that's in the cell. And it can't come back out. Because you keep pumping insulin. So people don't don't wrap their head around the chemistry and they're wondering like why they can't lose weight or how can how can fruits possibly make me fat smear you're crazy you're talking crazy and i'm like well no that's just how it works yeah and also but i think i think too like i don't think i don't think uh you know i i still kind of you know stick with the statement of nobody ever got fat from eating too much fruit in the sense that that for for ninety nine point nine percent of people is never the underlying cause, right? Like no one's ever be like, oh yeah, I eat perfectly healthy and I'm super active, but like I'm just super obese because I eat a lot of fruit. Like that's that's that doesn't happen. It's because they're eating all that fruit on top of other things that they're doing. They're coming from a bad place. They're thinking like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna you know have a healthy dessert. I'm just gonna have this you know all this fruit for dessert. I'm gonna be healthy. But it's like yeah, but you had pop tarts for breakfast. Right. So like, we're, we're not, you haven't earned this kind of thing. Right. Like that's how, that's kind of how I think about it. Yeah. That's actually, um, well said. 
well said, because uh, I hear that no one ever got fat from eating fruits. Um, and I, and I would have just had a knee jerk response and be like, well, yeah, they did. But without the details, which is, yes, they're already in that, uh, what I call that diabetic spectrum mm -hmm. or metabolic spectrum. And then they're just laying all that fructose on top. Yeah. Uh, saying that there are people that are quite sensitive. So I actually have, um, I've had two patients, but this one patient in particular thought that fruit was healthy, that they had to eat fruit. They thought fruit was essential. It's all that they've ever been taught. Sure. Yeah. So until I, I, I met this person, um, you know, I didn't even think that it didn't occur to me that some people just automatically think that you have to eat fruit. So she was forcing herself to eat fruit and it was making her vomit. So she oh. was fructose intolerant hmm. and she's healthy. Like in the sense, like if you looked at her, she's out, like she, she looks athletic, she's, um, but she was actually making herself severely sick by forcing herself to eat fruit. And that experience, you know, that, that was a whole deal. And we fixed it all. It was an amazing fix, like an amazing. We're talking like 10, 15 years of suffering fixed in like 90 days, like just mm. a beautiful story. Yeah. Uh, so I start to look, this is where I deep dive deep into fructose. There's lots of stuff that you can read on fructose. And fructose is really hard on the system in large amounts. So if you don't manage it, so yeah, no one got fat, we'll say just eating lots of fruit, but they did get sick. And so when I start to remove the fruit load in the in their mornings or late night, it makes a big difference. So when you fruit load too much, when you uh, denature it, when you separate the fructose glucose from the fiber, it's pretty bad. You might as well call it Coca-Cola. So these people that are doing their superfood um, shakes, you know, with their high oxalate uh, spinach and they're putting nuts in and then they're putting like four or five fruits, Oh my God, like if you ever wanted to give yourself a cocaine shake, that's the way to do it. If you ever wanted your front lobe to be like, bop, 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 that's the way to do it. So I say, take it easy, take it easy. You know, you're going to have something in the morning. You put the berries in your Greek yogurt. Yeah. You dress them up. You, you mix them up. You, you just, you know, settle down, settle down, right? Make sure you're eating food with your, with your fruits, right? Or uh, maybe you're athletic and you, and you eat some tangerines or whatever and you go work out. That's okay. But like there's planning, but I would, I would fruit load yourself in the kind of the apex of your day of like between that 12 and six time. I'd be like, you want your fruit, your mind's working the most, your body's working the most. Why not do it at the most active time so that you can hit the glucose ride, right? You take that out with, because you're active and the secondary fructose conversion you handle because you're taking it in the most active part of your day. So, so there is some considerations around fructose and, and hopefully, you know, people don't think I'm like out of my mind when I, when I'm like, be careful with fructose. <laughs> it's like, uh, it, I mean, it's the truth. You got to be careful with fructose. Especially well, I mean, it's that goes with anything. Like there's very few things in life that are just, you know, carte blanche do with it. And it's totally yeah. benign, no matter in what quantity and whatever, like everything has conditions to it. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's just another one of those things just to educate yourself on and, and understand how it fits well into your lifestyle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm like, like I said, I'm a big, Fruit person, I like fruit, but it's also the only carbohydrate I eat. I, I don't really eat any other carbohydrates. If I have a really, you know, active day, I'll do some white rice and that's, that's it. No pasta, no breads, nothing like that. Yeah. And, and I find that I do better with a little bit of carbohydrates. I've done super low carb, you know, keto and stuff like that. And I always feel, I find myself burning out, um, pretty quickly with that. Yeah. And I think, and that, and that comes back to that, a little bit of bio individual individuality as well. I think some people do like protein and fats. It's like one of those things, like pretty much everyone, we all need that. That's, that's pretty standard. That's, I never, I don't ever really see anyone saying they can't tolerate protein. I don't think that's a, that's a thing, um, specific kinds maybe and, and whatnot, but not in terms of just general mm -hmm. protein. Um, but carbs, I think is one of those big ones where it's like, you really have to experiment with yourself and find out what you tolerate when you need it 
that's like the big variable for me in most people's mm -hmm. diets is, is changing around your, your carb intake, because that's something definitely I've, I've noticed, like I've kept, you know, protein, the same, lots of healthy fats throughout the day, animal fats. Um, and, and that's solid and that doesn't really change, but for me, it's, it's definitely the carbohydrate. And I feel like for me, um, and maybe you can explain this a little bit better. I don't know, but the process of gluconeogenesis. So that's, that's turning protein into, into glucose, right? So yep. I read somewhere, or I, I listened to someone talk about how there can be some, um, upregulation of cortisol in that process. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I think so. I think for me is I'm a very like type a personality, very easy to be stressed out, kind of like go, 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 um, kind of a person. So I feel like for me, that process of, if I get into that process of gluconeogenesis, my cortisol starts getting up. I start feeling burnt out over time. Like, I don't know, does, does that make sense to you? That kind uh, of a, could I, that be a reason? I would argue that a little bit only in the sense of your body's, I mean, if you're in a healthy spectrum, gluconeogenesis is, is evolutionary and therefore it supports that you don't need carbohydrates the function of gluconeogenesis, like the creation of new glucose, can come from protein or can come from fats. So gluconeogenesis, so just the creation of glucose. Right. You, you must have glucose for your brain and your nervous system. Uh, so that's the confusion. People say, no, no, you need carbs for your brain and your nervous system. No, you don't need carbs, you need glucose. Yeah. And evolutionary wise, we've already come up with a system. Why would we have a system? to create our own glucose. So yeah. we don't need glucose, glu um, carbohydrates. Uh, and in the gluconeogenesis uh, measurement uh, from say, people argue like you, you have to be careful, mTOR path, like there's all these like pathways where they there's too much protein in your system. And then what happens is it gets stored as energy. Your body doesn't generally want to store protein as as fat it can it's quite a pathway to do it but it's a very small percentage so if you're constantly overeating i'd say it's about 13 percent there's a there's a, a percentage of protein that's going to be utilized and transformed into uh, glucose for your energy needs just in some people uh, it's just a slower processor. It's not as an efficient process. As you said, we all have like, we're all made uh, different. And mm -hmm. there are some people that are, they just, they just need that dietary carbohydrate. Like it just makes them feel better. And I, yep. and I hear this a lot and it's usually through fruit. They just have a little bit of fruit or they add fruit every so often they might have like some sourdough or just something um, white some rice. white rice yeah yeah and then and then they're good and I think that's um, that's just individuality there yeah uh, as long as you have uh, long spaces of time between meals um, as long as you you're not spending your day grazing and eating your body regulates protein pretty efficiently and excess protein will be excreted like it doesn't get stored as as fat it's not like this process that just happens but gluconeogenesis is not a it's it's a pretty efficient system of supplying exactly the amount of glucose that you need we have marathon runners we have endurance athletes that have made the conversion because remember how many cost country runners and marathon runners die of of heart attacks right uh, there's, there's big studies on how unhealthy the cardiovascular system is um and it's because they live on carbohydrates this is was their mindset was like gatorade and carb carving up carb loading yeah. and what we've discovered is that's not the way to go statistically you're going to give yourself heart disease cardiovascular uh, disease so we have now endurance athletes that are understanding gluconeogenesis and they are pulling all their carbohydrate needs glucose needs uh through fats uh medium chain triglycerides like you know mct oils as a, a nice uh, mm -hmm. energy source of of loading um, or just using really clean 
uh, carbohydrates, uh, staying away from the processed um, carbohydrates, where they used to just eat like pasta and yeah, do whatever type of of carbohydrate. So and giving I'd yourself look, just what you need, not extra, not any more than you, what you don't need, right? Yeah, like you you do have to train your body. Like something that I've come to understand is like when we use the word like fat adaption, you're trying to figure out how much carbohydrate intake you need. Some people are a little bit more sensitive is like fat adaption and carbohydrates. So most people, their carbohydrate, like they, they fuel themselves on glucose and they're like here and their fat, their ability to use fat is down here. They're not, they're not fat adapted. And then what happens is they go on a low carbohydrate diet or they do uh, a keto diet, a carnivore, you know, whatever low carb approach. Mm -hmm. And what happens is this comes down, but this doesn't come up because they just, they're, they're, they just don't know how to do it properly. Uh, their body doesn't convert yet. So what you do is you, you get rid of the sugars, you get rid of the sweet, and then you slowly change your carbohydrates from all that starch to just probably lower glycemic. And what happens is as this comes down, your capacity to pull fat as energy goes up. So you probably should never experience the keto flu or you should probably never experience these... Um, People feel sick almost, right? They go through crashes because they just decide to go on a non-carbohydrate diet, which I which I think yeah. is booty. Like, shouldn't just carbohydrates aren't evil. First off, you know, I I do promote low carbohydrate. It's probably the easiest fix I see for most people. For but sure. I have yeah. run into people uh, that I couldn't copy and paste. I couldn't just be like, boom, and carbohydrates wasn't the problem. It was their timing of carbohydrates. It was the amount of carbohydrates. There's plenty of people that I treat and they eat rice, uh, they eat potato, you know, it's just, I just change the serving sizes and I change the timing so that they're not so dependent emotionally on loading. You know, I've got a run around the bay where they would do like pasta the night before and they do just all this like car bloating and i'm just like well take it easy like <laughs> it's not it's not how the body works right yeah so we tested out i've tested out with the marathon runners and triathletes and stuff and what we do is we prepare them for the season and i get them off this kind of carbohydrate dependence but half the job is getting them emotionally off because they think that they need it and they start to realize that they actually don't need to like car bloat and if you want you like a plate of pasta after you've done your five, you know, K run or your 25 K run, like all the power to you, but I don't want you hitting that potatoes, mashed potatoes, rice, pasta, noodles, bread, every day of your life and loading in these exorbitant amounts. And you're fine with it just because you look skinny because you're not fine. And, mm -hmm. and that will affect your heart health. Right. Sure. And then it's this, and it's, and it's also then went right the moment, off the engine, didn't I? <laughs> I know. No, no, that's good. Like, and I think that's, it comes down to a, the lifestyle portion of it too, because there are some people that are, they, you know, they're getting away with some of this stuff in, at a certain point in their life, whether it's age or activity level, but when things change and their habits don't change and their diet doesn't adapt to that, things can fall off the cliff pretty quickly. So just because they're, you know, just because they're not, uh, you know, they have, you know, they look okay and they're, they're thin enough. They're not overweight. It's also what's going on on the inside too, right? When you stop running those marathons, but you're still eating the same things can go south pretty quickly. I mean, we've, we've all seen it like the old, older athletes in their, in their forties and fifties, after they retire, you see them sitting in the stand. You're like, Holy, that guy's huge. Yeah. They just balloon because they don't change any of their habits. They were just getting away with a lot of stuff when they were younger and a little bit more maybe metabolically flexible, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like where they're able to use all kinds of fuels. And that's what we mean by metabolically uh, flexible is that your system, when it needs glucose, like if I want to uh, be anaerobic, if I need to sprint like, uh, have sprint like actions or fast actions where my muscle, um, is taking the load and, I, and I'm moving at a certain velocity and rate. You can only do that for so long. You're pulling in glucose. You're you're asking your body to pull glycogen stores out of the muscle. You're pulling glucose out of your out of your uh, your blood. So yeah, when you when you do this kind of uh, workouts, you can eat certain 
But when you take those out, you can't, you're not efficient at using glucose the same way. So you have to adapt the way you eat. And, you know, actually speaking of that, you, as you get older and as you're changing your workouts, you have to understand that, you know, velocity movements, power movements, big, huge muscular movements, uh, need glucose. But if you're just like chill, you're just like walking, you're just slow grooving, slow moving, that takes fat. Mm -hmm. So people, I'll see people like half killing themselves on that 45 degree. I always use that because it just puts my boy where, because I watch people like this is what I do, right? And uh, I'll see the same person for a year, same weight. They're obese, same weight. And they're on the highest incline and they're doing stuff like that I think is crazy. They're like trying to sprint up it and dancing and moving and their weight doesn't change because they're, they're working a sugar system. They're working a glucose system. They're not working a fat system. They need to mm -hmm. lower that incline. <laughs> they need to lower the dance party and tap into fat energy because that's, you know, if you work at what, like 60% of, of your, your heart, uh, you, you, you change fuel system. So you understand that you're metabolically flexible. Your body starts to tune itself. You're not, you don't have too much carbohydrates and sugar in your system. Your body's like, okay, well, we're doing this kind of activity. We're going to hit the sugar today. Oh, they've changed heart rate. They changed, you know, what they're doing intensity. We're going to use this until eventually that, um, level of, of, uh, becoming fat adapted surpasses the sugar that's what fat adaption means is that when you're pulling fat it's here you can just keep pulling fat and then you'll be able to start pulling fat for anaerobic work ketones mm -hmm. and that's where we get into successful athletes that are carnivores uh they're keto they're low 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 carb under 20 grams of carbs and they are doing sprinter like work they're doing mma type work they're doing stuff that we normally think that you need glucose, um, but they've just changed it. The bar that they can pull fat and use it instantly is there now, right? So that's fat adaption, right? Yeah, they're just running a bit more of a efficient operating system, right? Very, very efficiency. So it's just a spectrum. Everyone has a different spectrum of where they're running, but pretty much as you start to remove like those starchy, refined or processed carbohydrates, um, you become much, much better like uh, at using what energy you need. Your workouts get better. And sure, coming back to a point you made, like if you feel like you need that little bit of something, something, I think it's okay. I think it's more than okay. I just think you run into trouble when you are emotionally dependent on it and you actually will not work out or you will avoid a certain exercise because you didn't have your fruit bowl or you didn't have your pasta the night before. That doesn't mm -hmm. make sense to me. Because yeah. uh, if you have to run away from a tiger, you run away from a tiger. If you have to mm -hmm. fight the tiger, you fight the tiger. You don't, it doesn't depend on whether you had corn or mashed potatoes the night before. You follow, you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, Your for system, sure. evolutionary wise, just works. And trust me, your body will produce all the glucose it needs in the time that you need to fight the tiger, run away from the tiger, or freeze in the bush to hide from the tiger, right? Yeah. It's that flexi flexibility. Right. You got that we're, we're designed to have. And that's that's what you want to get to is that point where you're just ready for anything at any point in time. Right. Ready to go. It's I mean, even with training kind of thing. Right. It's like if you're at a place where you need to, you know, warm up 30 minutes just to do your your exercises, you probably got some things you need to fix first before before you're doing the exercises, because you should probably just for the most part, most exercises, if you just, you see a bar, you should just be able to jump up there and do a few pull-ups and not worry about blowing a shoulder out or something. Right. If you're worried about that, there's something you need to work on first before you're yes. doing that exercise. Right. Yeah. It's always the, the weeks and months before whatever exercise you want to really excel at that counts. So just constant preparation of your joints, of, of particular movements, range of motion. That should always be integrated into your workouts. I know we, we spoke of some yeah. about that in our in our first podcast. So you guys should go back to the first podcast if you want to know more about how to prepare your joints. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because that's another that's another rabbit hole to go down. That's um, right. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some supplementation. Um, I think 
that's something that people always have a lot of questions about. It's something that I get asked, you know, from friends and family members all the time is, you know, what, uh, what protein should I be taking in? What I'm like, did you eat eggs today? Did, did you just like do the yeah. basic stuff first? Like don't, it doesn't matter what kind of protein you're taking. Like, just like, let's figure out the basics first yeah. and then yeah. we can worry about the supplements, but supplements well, do have I, their place. Right. Well, it does matter what kind of protein you're taking. No, I, I mean like, yeah, yeah. yeah um, uh, it yeah. does matter, but like oh, if you're, if you're, fired you're up, eh? yeah, <laughs> it doesn't like, it doesn't matter if your protein has, you know, your protein powder has yeah, yeah. 24 grams or 25 yeah. grams of protein. Yeah. If you've been eating yeah. pop tarts and, and cereal yeah. all day, like it, it's everything matters. Just there's a hierarchy of matter, I guess. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So in terms of supplements, so I think for me, one of the ones that I, whenever someone asks me, you know, what should I take is it's pretty across the board is, is vitamin D. That's, that's a big one for me. It's something I yep. recommend for everyone. It's something I tell my family to take. It's something, you know, I give my baby vitamin D drops. I make sure my wife is taking her vitamin D. Like that's just something that I think that, that everyone needs. And I talk about this all the time because I think it's such a, you know, it's such a low hanging fruit for most people. It's very, easy to take. It comes in drops. It's really small pills. Like there's really no reason why I think you should be take, you should not want to take it. Right. So, um, kind of wanted to get your thoughts on, on that and vitamin D supplementation, because that's another one. I think there's, it's kind of, it's a bit confusing. Um, because I think like when I first, when I first kind of started taking supplements and getting into nutrition, I, the first recommendation that I ever had was probably from like a, supplement store employee or, or something like that, or something I found online was, um, about a thousand, a thousand I use per 50 grams of body weight. That was kind of one of the, the first things that, you know, that, that I heard. And that was kind of the basic recommendation that I was going off of. And there was all this talk about vitamin D toxicity because it's, um, it's fat soluble. It's not water soluble. So, you know, you can't just piss it out. And I, I know this one, that's why I'm bringing this up. I'm trying to get you, trying to get you fired up here. Um, so I, yeah, I would love to hear a little bit about that. Um, your thoughts on that, on vitamin D dosages, because you have people, you know, online saying, Oh yeah, I take 20,000 I use and I, my testosterone went up and I feel great. Yep. Um, and, yep. and so it's like, why is, why is, where is this toxicity myth coming from basically? Well, uh, there's a toxicity myth in in that uh, fat soluble vitamins uh, can get to a toxic level in your cell and it can build up. It's theoretical, and we've already done tons of testing, like time and time again, and we have a graph. And theoretically, you will start to get symptoms of toxicity. Um, if you, and that just starts, you'd have to take 30,000 IUs a day for six months. And theoretically, you'll start to get dizzy, nauseous, maybe fuzzy behind the eyes. You'll get like kind of nervous tics, uh, stomach ache. There is no reported D3 toxicity or death. For that matter, natural health products, there is no... Um, when do we start? 1950s or 1960s poison control. Somewhere in the 50s or 60s, there's no reported deaths or overdose with vitamins and minerals ever. So before we even start the conversation, that's what you should start it with. No one died of taking vitamin D3. Um, no matter your weight, your size, generally speaking, uh, a nice healthy dose is 10,000 IUs a day. If you uh, have a smaller child, they're a bit younger, if they're under 16, you can work them up to about 5,000 IU a day. If they don't eat fermented foods, you must, it's absolutely imperative that they have a K2 vitamin. They need K2. We used to draw K2 uh, from fermented foods that was uh, a regular for us and from our um, ruminant animals, right? So animals weren't grazing on grains, they were grazing on grass, uh, which they create the K2 that we need. Uh, so on things on toxicity, first off, um, you no one's dying of toxicity. It's pretty theoretical. You'd have to have really, really high super doses and fat-soluble vitamins, um, 
they monitor each other. Uh, otherwise, the Inuit people would have died out, right? Because they eat like blubber and, uh, you know, all the fish. And, you know, they have high loads of vitamin A, high loads of K2, high loads of vitamin D3, vitamin E. Like they have all the fat soluble vitamins. So if you want to look at a case study of, of a race dying out, they flourish. Everyone thinks that they're big because uh, they have a, it's like a Mongolian feature. What people don't understand is when they take their furs off, they're actually uh, a pretty lean race if they're living without uh, Western yeah. foods. Ancestral way, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so when it comes to vitamin D3, it is like um, kind of a miracle uh, vitamin that makes all other functions and mechanisms work, especially hormonally. So when I have patients that have come in with uh, low testosterone, I, I, do a vitamin D3 test and they're always abysmally low, which is super low. Um, so I get them on like high doses of vitamin uh, D3. And what's retest. the level you're looking for there? 250. So the range goes, I believe, 70 to 250. So look at that reference, brutal. So like when you have a medical diagnosis or you're looking at it medically and you go see your doctor and they test your D3, if you are within the reference, it's the end of the conversation most times. Uh, where when you go to a nutritionist, uh, someone holistic, functional medicine, someone that works in the realm of nutrition, we want to optimize you. And we know mm -hmm. hormonally you need vitamin D3. It's going to go through that reduction until it... They think people say like vitamin D3 is actually a hormone. Well, it's not a hormone. It has to go through stages. It's the feeder for that hormone. Um, so if you want to build estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, like any type of uh, anything part of the endocrine system, your hormonal system, and you're low on vitamin D3, how do you think you're going to build those hormones? And people say, oh, well, I go outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish that worked. Well, when you go outside, that is your body's amazing. So D3 that you get from the sun is not D3 that you get from dietary food. This is the confusion. Again, let's go to the northern races or anyone that's in a polar area where they don't have sun for, I don't know, six months or whatever. How's your D3 theory working for you? We mm -hmm. test them. Their D3 is off the roof, man. They don't get no sun. So And in the summer, you're wearing sunscreen and you're fully clothed and – Got it. Wearing so you sunglasses have to get and yeah. D3 from the sun. So people will go and they stop taking their D3 supplementation because it's summertime. I retest them, their D3 is low again, and they're like confused. I'm like, just think of, you know, it's kind of a simple way, just think that the D3 production that you get from the sun is your natural sunscreen. Therefore, you burn when you go to Mexico for the first week, the second week, and you're like, sun suntan lotion and then uh, the next week you kind of forget you get lazy you don't put as much but you don't burn week four week five say you stay in mexico for two months guess who's not using suntan lotion uh, at the end of two months because your d3 starts to build the protection that you need so the d3 you get from the sun is your natural sunscreen therefore the natives of people wherever they live in hot tropical areas or or close to the equator they're not using sunscreen they're just skin matches and they produce enough D3. You go into colder climates with less sun, D3 has to come from dietary. And because our D3 is depleted dietary wise, uh, you need to supplement in this day and age. There are so many factors that are preventing D3 bioavailability that you have to supplement. I think it's, it's, a, it's just absolutely important. It's one of the first supplements that I get people to do so I can fix their hormones, I can fix their menstrual cycle, I can fix um, their strength gains, their uh, raise their testosterone, um, change their mood, you know, their anxiety and mood. You bring in D3, it's like a miracle vitamin, right? Uh, and then again, like I, I'll, I've said it already, but I'll say it again, you don't want D3 on its own because when D3 is on its own, it pulls in calcium. That's what, what that's the big push. We used to think uh, giving people uh, calcium horse pills um, was making their bones firm. But unfortunately, what we did was we increased the rate of atherosclerosis. We actually were, were calcifying their arteries, their heart, um, 
because when you ingest uh, not food calcium, but when you like take pills of calcium, it actually uh, plaques and calcifies your arteries. And uh, there's a 20%, I think it's uh, about 20% uh, when, when they're looking at heart patients, uh, it increases your uh, atherosclerotic condition by 20% just by giving someone calcium. So you take D3, it pulls in the calcium. If you don't take K2, the calcium just runs amok. It just sits in your bloodstream and just starts going into tissue and it forms different kind of osteoph like it gives you kind of bone conditions. You take K2 and uh, there's there's two protein mechanisms, just trying to remember osteocalcin and uh, matrix TLA. It's, there's there's two uh, like proteins and one pulls it out of your tissue and the other one drives it into the bone. You see, it's miraculous. So if we were eating ancestrally, no problem. It's already happening. Your diet would have given you the D3, um, the meats and the fermented foods would have been giving you your K2. Life is great. But, you know, people don't eat fermented foods. They don't even know what fermented foods are. They think it's pickled. Um, they, so if you're uh, eating fermented foods daily, you don't think that you necessarily need to take K2 or like what's uh, how much of that should uh, you be taking? Well, I, I'm always I always play on the safe side. So say you came to me and you didn't know any of this. I have you set at 240 micrograms daily uh, with whatever amount of vitamin D3. Oh, it's like it's a standard 240 uh, micrograms. Okay, of K2. And yeah. then I look at your diet and you're like, you, you have your kefir, your fermented sauerkraut, you know, you have lots of fermented food. You tell me you're starting to eat uh, grass fed, grass finished meats. Then I say, okay, we'll drop down to 120 micrograms. Uh, and then that's just as a, as a, like a, a, a catch all, you know, right. it's important because, um, People are like, well, why do I have to supplement if I eat so healthy? And I'm like, because of the environment that you live in. So you're fighting a battle that you don't even know. You could be like holier than thou in the field of angels and blessed foods, and like whatever. But that doesn't stop uh, Wi-Fi, uh, EMG. Like it doesn't stop um, kind of um, all environmental the, factors right yeah there's like toxins there's microfibers microplastics there's there's rays there's there's all kinds of stuff that you don't even know that you're fighting right there's phytoestrogens there's, there's just stuff that interrupts the proper mechanisms of the body so i'm like you know what we just we just gotta cover ourselves and so yeah like I, uh, and then uh, like i've had someone come from the nutrition store and they're like I talked to the naturopath uh, that was at the health food store and they were so panicked and they're like, where did you get this information? You know, you're going to give yourself like some blood clotting issues. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, because I told you to take 240 micrograms of K2. First off, first off, uh, in Canada, we're a little bit behind in, in our understanding of K2. So when you research, so if you go up on Google and it's kind of Canadian based, you're going to find uh, daily values. They're all based on K1, which is plant-based, which has to do with clotting. So yeah, you don't want to mess with K1. Like when you're having surgery and stuff, they tell you, you know, stop that a hundred percent. But K2 doesn't interfere with clotting. K2 has to work with calcium and stuff like that. But all our research, all our understanding, all like uh, medical training is on K1. So they fear monger people and they tell people to avoid K1. Uh, if you've had thrombosis or you had clotting or whatever, they get you off the K1, the K1, but they tell you K2. People don't know the difference. Um, so it's really important for you to know where to look, what to study, and make sure that what you are reading or studying is actually based on K2. If it's on K1, you will be scared to death and you, they will talk you out of it. You, you will, you'll just be like, think you're taking rat poison or something like it's, it's really bad. It's misinformation. I was really upset with the one, uh, patient, not for them that they were like petrified because they had been taking 240 micrograms and I had to send them all kind of information. I had to walk them through the mechanism of how K2 works, how it doesn't interfere with 
with uh, coagulation or clotting or breaking up blood. Like there's two different things. One is animal based or fermented based. The other one is plant based. Uh, but this kind of stuff people don't know. They take it for granted. So to answer your question, I would still want you to take 120 micrograms. Uh, and remember, the, the daily value is also set on K1. So the, it, I think there's a regulation. The maximum you can take is 120. Some areas it's 90. But those regulations are based on, on K1 values, not K2. Right. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's something I definitely should look into for myself because I'm not taking any K2 with my, my vitamin D. I, I do eat fermented foods kind of throughout the day, but it would be nice to maybe just, like you said, sort of a, a catch-all for that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, you're, if, you, if you've got good quality meats or, or you have your fermented foods, you are getting your your K2 intake. So I don't think there's an issue, especially if you're not a – if you're a whole foods person, you know, you just like – pretty clean food, then you're in a good place. Um, I'm always like, as a therapeutic nutritionist, I'm, I'm working with people that usually, either it's a high performance thing that we're trying to work out, or they're sick. So I have to come in with a with a plan to redirect calcium. Intervention. Yeah, it's, it's, it's intervention. But I think for everyone, if the average person is not intaking enough fermented foods throughout the day, which it's, most it's most people thing. most people no. don't. Yeah, they're eating just pickles. <laughs> so yeah, I get them to do the K two, and then when it comes to protein, like there's nine essential amino acids, and I know there's an argument that with plant foods, uh, you know, that you you getting all of them. What is there like twenty amino acids in it? But but when you're looking at the actual peptide, or when you're looking at like the form of amino acids from proteins. Um, it's not bioavailable. So when people say, yeah, I had my protein this morning. So well, what'd you have? They said, I had a peanut butter sandwich. <laughs> and they said, well, on the, on the nutritional label, it said it's like eight grams per whatever. And I'm like, yeah, I know, I know. But like, like a tablespoon of, of peanut butter is not the same as a tablespoon of ground beef. Mm -hmm. Like they're not even in the same book. And then the problem is when you when you're trying to match protein, let's say it's all plant based, I think it's a lysine and a tryptophan, and then tryptophan converts into serotonin, feel good, and that's why you get so many mood disorders. Uh, what's his name, Doctor? Uh, brain energy. Have you heard of the book Brain Energy? No, I haven't. Oh, I can't remember his name. So he's a psychiatrist that has turned to health and nutrition. So if you ever want in like 10 years, like high level, like people travel around the world to Palmer, Dr. Palmer, and you get mood disorders and uh, you're dysregulated um, because you're not converting tryptophan into serotonin, like your serotonin's off, right? And you start to get into mood disorders. So that's why like vegans and vegetarians usually have an associated mood disorder time and time again. And this is not just me saying it, this is like psychiatrist and many psychiatrists now are starting to understand that there's a chemical imbalance. So I always say, you know, try to get to a way isolate, like a really clean form of protein, maybe New Zealand uh, protein. But I mean, any animal protein is, is fairly good. This depends on what your budget is. Um, always try to eat just, just an animal meat. Like you don't have to go one gram of protein for one pound or whatever people come up with. Just eat. Wake up, if you want a breakfast, pull out the eggs, the bacon, the tuna, the trout, the steak, whatever. If it was breathing and moving at one point, it's a protein. If it wasn't breathing and moving and it had leaves, it's not a protein. So get off me with your hemp and your chickpea and your quinoa and your, it just, like it's not, you, you need six or seven of them to kind of create an amino acid profile, like, like the full, the full chain, yeah. get all your essentials. And then even then, when we look at the individual, uh, amino acid where people will argue, no, no, you can get all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. I'll go with it. I agree with you. You can get all of them, but let's look at the amount of tryptophan or lysine. Let's look at the individual content of each amino acid. I dare you bring it, bring it. Yeah. Show me the yeah. comparison. But then also, yeah, but then also it's it's one of those arguments that it's like, 
are we talking about are we talking about the science of it or are we talking about what people are actually doing right because how many how many like vegans or vegetarians are actually every day calculating how many amino acids they're having on their protein and it's like oh i need an extra cup of beans to make up this whatever amino acid nobody's doing that it's not happening so for One some people a million yeah exactly so for some people like we said, like veganism, like would maybe work for them. I mean, it, it, anything can like short term, anything can work for anybody. But in terms of long term, sure, maybe there's long term some vegans or vegetarians that they intrinsically naturally do a really good job of some of the conversions and, and whatnot. So they can get away with a lot of this stuff right in the long term and still feel OK. But the average person, like you have to look at the average person, what the average person is is doing, their habits, right? Are they making those conversions? Are they calc are they getting all those amino acids? Probably not. That's it's not happening. That's why eating, you know, a whole foods, mostly animal based diet, it's just it's idiot proof. Like you can just live your damn life just by eating those kind of foods and not have to worry about everything all the time. And that yeah. just makes sense I, for most people. I haven't to date had um, a vegan, vegetarian, or pescatarian, you know, just eat the fish. Yeah. Come in here and have like great iron levels. I haven't had them have great vitamin D3 levels, um, terrible B12 levels. Like you can't even get B12 from, from what they're doing. Um, like when we want to talk science and chemistry and biology, like those are like easily measurable things where you're like, you're always deficient. How is that possible? Like you're always deficient. You can't draw it from your food. So, how do you support what it is that you're doing? And you can you can feel better because you cut out the cofactors. I've had people that have eaten like raw veggies for like five years, 10 years, and then it catches up with them until their bodies just, they can't do it. But I also see in the side scroll on my screen, I'll see all the medications they're taking. Mm -hmm. How do you explain that? Like time mm -hmm. and time again. It's not just one time, it's time and time again. They've all got GAT, you know, like generalized anxiety disorder, um, bipolar, there's a, a depression, there's like, ba 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 ba. There's no, there's no individual that ever walked in here. And it just might be me in my clinic, but there's no one that ever came in because they're coming in. There's a problem. That's what I'm mm -hmm. saying. They're coming in. Yeah. Uh, and the young ones that are on their vegan diets, like so many of these influencers now that I've seen, I follow these stories, come out and they've been secretly eating meat, right? Uh, and then they come out and they say, you know, I had this condition, I was having this condition. And then you find out that they've been slipping themselves uh, protein. Uh, that one's a really hard, hard one to uh, argue. I'm really fascinated when I am listening to doctors or PhDs or like high level educated people talking about a plant based, a plant based approach. Meanwhile, like chemistry wise, what I said is factual. Like if I took, showed you a, a biology book or a physiology book or like a, something like that. Like, I don't think it can be disputed. This is bioavailable. This is how the molecule looks. This is how your body recognizes it. This is how it gets broken down. End of story. Like there's no discussion. And then, uh, uh anthrop what's it called? Anthropology and uh, paleontology. And when we are looking at fossils and, you know, they can carbon date and what is it called? Like the, isolate what they can I, isolate carbons you know like it's a little bit beyond my pay grade yeah, yeah but i can read the reports they can figure out what these people ate in time and time again you can see that uh plant stuff was incidental it wasn't the majority of their diets and then in in any type of tribe or race or you know people that they studied that had a little bit heavier plant based they did find some diseases not not crazy a mouse but they did find uh, more fractures more uh, signs of diabetes uh, anything that was like uh, more plant-based and then in the agricultural uh, like about twelve thousand years ago that's where you just find yeah diabetes that's where everything comes obesities. yeah there's a lot of of illness in the agricultural societies brain size comes down bone size comes down and in the hunter gatherers where they're still heavily based with healthy fats and meats. They're bigger. They have bigger brains, bigger skulls, bigger muscles, you know, uh, bigger bodies, uh, less fractures, less, uh, they have, uh, almost no 
no rot in the jaw and the teeth and mm -hmm. it's opposite in the plant-based so yeah i like I, I think i heard uh i think paul saladino said said something about like there's a difference between foods that we that make us thrive and then there's survival foods right yep. so some of those well, plant-based yep. foods like when there's there's nothing to hunt the animals have disappeared okay you eat what you can we're we can adapt in the short term yes. to eat a lot of different things right but is that Absolutely. optimal for us probably not no yeah but it's a survival evolutionary mechanism so i'm not saying like what is it dr chafee likes to say uh you know plants are out to kill you you know I think it's just a running joke with him, you know, from, from what yeah. his professor had said. And also a lot of it's a lot of this stuff is marketing and being sure. extreme and trying to get yeah. attention. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you know, like I'm not, I don't think like asparagus and broccoli and cauliflower, you know, is out to kill you or something. I just think there's when I look at your plate and it's 75 percent of your intake and you're wondering why you're not at your most optimized uh, place. That's why, because you're not getting your micronutrients. You're not getting what your body needs to thrive. As you said, you're getting just enough to survive. And then bringing us back to you're in a modern world of 2023 and you've got a battle on your hands. You have this invisible battle that you have no clue about is going on all the time. Uh, you know, and I don't want you to have to walk around with like tin foil over your head, but but there's pollution, there's toxins, there's there's all kind of magnetic waves. There's like stuff that's in our environment. We have stressors that are like, you know, we always have blue light. We always like we're working eight, 12 hours. We're always up. We're not getting enough sleep. Like there's so many factors. So the one thing that is within your power is to at least look at the foods and make sure that it's nutrient dense. And even when I'm working with, uh, uh, what do you call that, low social demographics or like, uh, which I had to change because you don't learn that in school. It's everything is just like very rigid. You know, I'm not making people um, eat super smoothies in the morning because that's not how it works. Some people got to live out of cans and boxes, mm -hmm. right? That's just, that's just the way it goes. Especially with these uh, days with inflation. Yeah, and 30% yeah. higher. So I can work with that. I, it's no problem. I can work with You can make. I'll literally have people switch to um, eating uh, a bunless hot dog, you know, uh, frying up uh, bologna with uh, with mustard instead of their sugary granola bar that they start the day with and then wondering why they have diabetes. They don't mm -hmm. eat that much because they're poor, right? And they actually don't eat that much. But if you look at what they eat, it's all just like refined, starchy stuff that they think is healthy. And I literally get them switched to... Uh, stuff like that, like lunch meats, deli meats, uh, a little bit of fermented foods if they can, you know, sneak it in there, uh, like some kombucha drink, or yep. I show them how to make their own kombucha. And they soon enough turn it around. Like I got them eating like tuna cans. I'd rather you eat spam than half the, those cereals that they eat. And the, I know people have a hard time wrapping their head around that, but if we have a comparison of chemicals, comparison of ingredients, one is just so much more nutrient dense yeah. than, than that's that funny. Garbage. That's yeah. a funny comparison. Like if you, if you went to the grocery store and you took a can of spam, right. And you compared it to, you know, one of these, um, I guess the term is like greenwashing labels, right. Where they make it seem like it's super healthy and amazing, whatever of like these, this cereal. And then you compare those two, right? Like if you ask someone who, what do you think is healthier, right? Like they'll say, Oh, the healthy cereal that says yeah. it's organic and it has organic cane sugar <laughs> and organic vegetable oils and, and all this other bullshit that people get fooled yeah. on and for marketing companies. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's funny, but you do the best, you do the best you can with what you got right at the end of the day. Yeah. And there's always a way. And I, uh, that's one of the learning curves that really, I'm really proud of actually is um, learning to work with everyone and not coming in so hard. It's come in so hard, you know, it's like, but uh, I've really started to learn that there's such a kind of human condition. There's such an emotional side um, to eating and you cannot be rigid and it's not copy and paste and everyone is an absolute um, individual and their lives do matter. Uh, their stressors, their job, their family unit. Like there are so many factors that, 
you know, a dietitian just may not consider. You know, there's like, this is the calories you take. This is the exercise you do. This is your macronutrients. And sometimes I'll sit here and, and I'm going to have a 45-minute talk and an assessment about their lives because that will give me more information of how I'm going to fix their food yeah. than if they gave me their food journal. Like, I yeah. want your food journal, but I want to know you. Mm -hmm. And um, that's... There's a bit of, uh, yeah, therapist kind of... Uh, yeah, part no, to that, 100%. right? Uh, you, can't, you can't take out the human, the human element, and you can't assume that yeah. everyone has the same level of discipline as you do and cares about as about that stuff as much as you do. That's something that I'm trying to practice myself. That's one of the the principles from from Stoicism, from from Marcus Aurelius. He says, you know, self, you know, discipline with yourself, tolerant with others, right? Like you can't yes, can't hold your can't yeah. hold others to the same standards that you hold yourself to, right? Yeah. Like projecting, projecting our own standards on people. I mean, we use words like guilt and shame and, uh, it's a hard argument and I know we're, we're starting to run out of time, but it's, there's a lot of guilt and shame on people that are sick. They're obese. They're, um, they have diabetes, they're, they're heart disease, hypertension. And we know it. it's, it's health, uh, style driven. It is healthy patterns that drive it and we blame them but we have to blame ourselves first because we're the ones that told them to eat that way and we've been telling them to eat that way since the 70s and why would they disbelieve you so mm -hmm. if you're a professional you have a title you wear a white lab coat some people just listen so we call it health literacy and people are health illiterate and it would blow your mind below because it blew my mind <laughs> drive a man to drink but it will blow your mind and you're like is this a real conversation like am i having a real conversation and it started to make me really empathize uh, to understand it. just people sometimes go on google and they just believe what it is or someone told them something or their aunt told them something or their sister told them something and they just believe it uh they're not stupid it's not it's not it's not your intelligence it's their health literacy. They just simply don't understand. And they are looking to a higher power to tell them what to do. And that's what's driven them in the corner. And I always end the session with, how's that been working for you? Mm -hmm. How's that been working for you? Because it obviously hasn't. So all your objections to what I'm saying don't make sense right now. Because you have no clue what you're talking about. Because yeah. you're sitting in my chair, you're obese, You've had a heart event, you have heart disease, you have hypertension, you're a mess, you're a complete mess, and you're still arguing with me that you think eggs cause heart attacks, that you can't eat eggs and bacon. You haven't eaten eggs and bacon. You've eaten Weetabix for the last 20 years. You've eaten yeah. your granola bars. You've had your kale and, and spinach uh, a smoothie. You're in my chair. You haven't eaten red meat. You have kidney disease. You, you have gout. You've eaten your fruits and vegetables, grains and tubers and leaves and bark and whatever else you've been told to do and used your margarine. You're in my chair. You should start eating your eggs and bacon, right? And get rid of all the other stuff. But they don't know that. So you have to be, yeah, you have to have some empathy and be gentle and patient. And that's what I've tried to do. And I've had a pretty high success rate, uh, just understanding that. They've been conditioned. They've been conditioned from the time that I've been out of the womb till now. And it's going to take a lot of unconditioning uh, to get them to eat more more properly. Yep. Um, I, I know we didn't have a chance. We were going to talk about um, the new uh, the new uh, laws that are that are coming in for uh, natural health products. I know. I don't know if we'll be able to have another conversation, uh, but that's that's going to be a big one. It's going to be a really, really big one coming on, but I think that's a full conversation. Yeah, I think so too. I think we'll have to do another episode down the line because that's uh, there's a lot more to talk about. But um, yeah, thanks for your time here, Samir. As always, um, lots of great knowledge. I think um, you know anyone who's looking to improve their health, physically, uh, nutrition, everything should come come see you because you got a lot to lot to share a lot of experiences a lot of knowledge and clearly a passion for all this stuff so um, if anyone's listening i'd recommend that they reach out to 
to Samir and, and get their shit fixed, get back on track. Cause uh, obviously something's not working for you if you're, if you're looking, looking for this type of information. So well, be open-minded. I think they should, it's a uh, Riberian radio. And I, everyone should be uh, not just not just to watch me. You, you've had some other podcasts that I think were interesting and that they should uh, uh, kind of watch, get on the YouTube. Uh, I think both of us always appreciate when you share and you like uh, and you subscribe. It makes a big difference for us. It's, it's quite impactful. Um, I was telling Peter, like people are reaching out to me. They're they're uh, messaging. So it, it really helps our livelihood, too. You know, it helps us. Uh, continue our our passion so i would hope for those that are listening to this podcast that you reach out to peter as well um, i'm always scoping out his videos <laughs> absolutely we're just getting started here we're just yeah, getting started thanks again cool and uh hopefully we talk soon yep sounds good all right take care see you.